Cecil Lewis was a student of J.G. Bennett and Bennett had the idea of setting up a community in Africa and he sent Cecil Lewis to go forth and find the site to start their community which was going to be a Gurdjieff work community and Cecil Lewis talks about this in his book Gemini to Joburg and I'm just going to read some of the one of the chapters of what Cecil Lewis talks about of trying why they were doing this and the difficulties he had so he's talking about what Bennett was asking them to do our leader firmly believed and had persuaded us that a holocaust would overtake Europe within a few years and that finding a suitable site and preparing people to come through the disaster safely preserving these ideas was a sacred task entrusted to us. Although in hindsight the whole venture seems ill-judged, impractical and prophetically amateur, it is worth pointing out that the, only the timing was wrong. Today a greater threat hangs over the whole world. It seems as if some dreadful cancer has taken a death grip on mankind and is spreading at accelerating speed. Its symptoms are violence, greed and corruption all justified by monstrous hypocrisy and blind stupidity. Whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad. A terrible price may have to be paid for such heedless self-indulgence. Gurdjieff has said that our solar system is now passing through a periodic climax of tremendous tension. This shows itself in wide variability in solar activity, in sunspots, atmospheric disturbances, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, droughts, floods and climatic irregularities. In man it produces two opposite effects. On the one hand an insatiable impulse to destroy, on the other a deep instinctive impulse towards spiritual growth. Both impulses can be clearly seen today. On which of them predominates the future of our civilization depends. If we wake up to our madness, the development of life on earth can enter a new phase. If not, it will be difficult to escape self-destruction and the end of all we have built up. Life will be reduced to its beginnings. The choice is ours. In the meantime, there may be some who are curious to know how our unlikely adventure fared and how it ended. We had embraced the challenge, taken the opportunity and committed ourselves to the project. Why? Trying to put myself back into those faraway days, I find I continually return to one basic idea. It came up in conversation back in London with John Bennett a year before. We were speaking of the parlous state of the world, how it was growing worse and worse, and it seemed there was nothing anyone could do about it. You could do nothing to set the world to rights, he said, but you can do something to set yourself to rights. If you are all right, the world will be all right. This idea struck me with enormous force. It changed my life. I had always looked outward. If this were changed, if that were improved, if the other were prohibited, etc., etc. It was a sort of revelation to see that society was composed of thousands of individuals who collectively produced governments, movements, trends, and so on. Each played a minute part in the whole, but if every individual behaved differently, the total result would be different. It all depended on me. This fundamental reversal of attitude, where to place the blame, where to look for the remedy, inward not outwards, became from that moment the mainspring, the principle of all my thought and indeed the chief directing force of my life. I suppose it must be one of the oldest ideas in the world, but when in my school days the church told me I was a miserable sinner and that there was no health in me, it left me cold. I, the son of two generations of parsons, would have nothing to do with it. Sin to me was theft or murder, and I was not guilty of that. And as to health, it just wasn't true. I was a very healthy young man. But now I saw there could be sins of motive, sins of attitude, sins of thought. All these if I looked inward, not outward. This was the key to change. From that point of view, everything was different. Besides, there was something I could do about it. 
I could change. All I had to do was to find out how, and this was where Gurdjieff came in. How to change. It was the mainspring of Gurdjieff's teaching. Without escaping from an absolutely mechanical way of life, without waking up, nothing was possible. The idea is not new. It is basic to all serious religions expressed in different ways. The Gospels are full of it. But we do not see it because we have grown into the habit of looking at sacred books literally, never pondering what is the true meaning, the inner message of the words. So the idea that we are asleep sounds preposterous, ridiculous. We do not even bother to examine it. Besides, we cannot believe that our lives are literally all dreams, fantasies, empty of meaning. That is too much for our egos, our self-importance, our pride. And that is why change, which, as a concept, seems so desirable, turns out to be a cross when you come to grips with it. And that is why it has been so constantly ignored by generations and generations of men. But while Gurdjieff faced us with the terror of the situation, he also brought hope. And not only hope, but practical help, the means by which if we worked at it, we would be enabled to wake up. He himself was a living example of what powers a man could attain to when he was fully awake and saw the world and people around him and himself most of all as he was real, not the dream we all have that we are what we think we are. From this lifetime of search, struggle and effort, from the hidden corners of the world, he had shown truths that had been lost or forgotten and these he now brought back to share of all those who would work to understand them. Thus he disclosed a marvellous system of world laws and world maintenance, that is, the way the universe itself was put together, recreated and maintained itself. At the same time he unfolded a detailed dissection of man, and the way he is made and can grow. You have no idea, he said, of the possibilities of man, and the powers he is capable of attaining. But the price of this treasure, this kingdom of heaven, is a persistent, untiring struggle with yourself not to forget the aim, not to sleep, to live and die honourably, not perish like a dog. So we blithely entered on the trail of the saints, and though we still had a long way to go, it was certain hope that we could earn this liberation that made all the struggle more than worthwhile. That was the reason we had come to Africa, into conditions and a way of life strange to us, in the certainty it was essential to the world to come, that all these hopes should be preserved and survive.